Right, okay, so my presentation is um, digital dissection of biting in, in suction feeding and biting fish. Um, okay, so first question, why do we care about soft tissue? We're paleontologists, we deal with hard tissue, we deal with bones and teeth. Um, but living organisms are more than bones and teeth. They've got muscles, they've got blood vessels. And if you want to understand paleobiology of extinct taxa, you need to understand what their soft tissues were doing. And you, so you need to make assumptions about what the soft tissues were like. And for my work, that's mostly about muscles because Muscles determine Im ecologically important things like how hard you bite and how fast you move. Um, and there are various ways you can do that. The most famous is probably um, Lawrence Whitmer's extant phylogenetic bracket, where you look at um, two taxa either side of your fossil, and based on what the soft tissues are like in your living forms, you can then sort of extrapolate back and make assumptions about what the te soft tissues were like in your fossil. Um, why do we care about soft tissues in fish, specifically? Um, so the fish tetrapod transition was a major event in the evolution of vertebrates. And one of the main things that happened at this transition was a shift from suction feeding in the aquatic environment to um, just biting and jaw prehension in a terrestrial environment. Um, but one of the problems with trying to reconstruct paleoecology in transitional forms across fish tetrapod transition is this issue of wide brackets. There aren't many particularly closely related um, living, living taxa that neatly bracket early tetrapods. And what we do have, so like lungfish, are very highly derived and very specialized and not very representative of the ancestral forms, they're not very useful. Um, another issue is that the muscle data that we do have is mostly in the form of sort of these 2D line drawings. Um, sorry, it's a pointer. Um, and it's very difficult to get information about, um, say, cross-sectional area from drawings like this. And there is three-dimensional data available, but there's not much of it, and it's all from tetrapods. So trying to remedy that. Um, one way that you can get three-dimensional data is through this method of contrast-enhanced CT scanning. And so we applied this method to two living fish, um, Essex lucius, northern pike, which is a suction feeder, and anguilla anguilla, European eel, which is a biter. And these served as functional analogues for early tetrapods. And so we decided to compare the soft tissue anatomy between these two taxa to maybe try and get a better handle on what early tetrapods might be doing. So how does contrast-enhanced CT work? So first thing you do is you get your specimens and you CT scan them. You just CT scan them normally. And that gives you a lovely data set of high-resolution scans of all the bones and all the teeth and all the normal heart tissues. Then you add a contrast enhancement agent, which is normally like iodine stains. Um, and then this is taken up by the soft tissue and increases the X-ray attenuation, which means that when you put your specimen back in the CT scanner, um, the soft tissues actually show up under the CT and you get a lovely high-res soft tissue data set. Then we imported these data sets into Aviso, which is a 3D reconstruction package, and used that to make 3D re reconstructions. Um, we segmented individual bones out and individual muscles. Um, you do the bones and muscles separately, and then you put the two together to make a musculoskeletal model, which served as the basis for all the anatomical descriptions. And in order to make these descriptions qualitative rather than, sorry, rather to make them quantitative rather than qualitative, sorry about that, um, then we actually got numbers out of these um, reconstructions and measured the cross-sectional areas of the muscles in a viso using standard um, volume over length to get cross-sectional area. Right. So um, I'm just going to whiz through the hard tissues first. Um, so that's dorsal, ventral, lateral, and medial views of um, pike and of the eel, again, lateral, medial, dorsal, ventral. Um, the main sort of units of bones, you've got um, skull roof and the brain case. Uh, the suspensorium, which is this import quite important bone complex made of the higher mandibular in red, quadrate in green, and the preopercular in blue. Um, you've got the lower jaw, um, upper jaw, and the opercular series, um, the opercular bone, the purple there. Um, the Homologous bones are colour coded, so the same colour between the eel and the pike. And um, these images are also not to scale. I should point out the eel skull in actuality is only about half as long as the pike skull. And that and so none of these images are to scale. <laughs> right. So moving on to the muscles. Um, so the adductor mandibuli, um, these are the jaw closing muscles. Um, I should also point out that the nomenclature for all these muscles has gone through a complete revision in the last couple of years, and so I'm going to be using the updated names in this presentation. Um, so the, you've got, so the adductor mandibuli is divided into two segments. You've got the facial segment and the mandibular segment, um, and each of these segments is divided into parts. So the 
facial segment is divided into um, the pars rectalis, um, ventrolateral, the pars malaris, dorsolateral, and um, a pars stigalis, which is the medial part, and in both the pike and the eel, um, the stigalis is further subdivided into the epistigalis on top and the substigalis on the bottom. Uh, so the epistigalis and substigalis. Again, homologous muscles colour coded between two. Um, the fascialis ins originates from the suspensorium, so from the high mandibular, uh, the preopercular quadrate, and then inserts onto the lower jaw via um, the mandibular tendon, which is this lovely um, yellow green thing here in the eel, and which you can't really see in the pike because um, the tendon runs between um, these other two muscles here, which form part of the segmentum mandibularis, which I'm about to come on to. Um, so the mandibularis is divided into two parts again, um, the coronalis on top and the mentalis on the bottom. It's actually easy to see on the, in the medial view here. Um, this segment, you'll notice, is completely absent in the eel. Um, and this, and in the pike, it attaches to the medial side of the lower jaw. Right. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, this is just a couple of transverse slices through the um, adductor mandibuli muscles to give you a better idea of um, the comparative cross-sectional areas of t um, in the different taxa. Like I said, these muscles aren't scale. I've tried, I've tried to scale them to the same size. Um, so you can see that um, the malaris in the eel actually doesn't just originate from the suspensorium. It comes right on top of the, right onto the skull roof. And that gives it a massive cross-sectional area. And um, as you'll see when I come to actually look at the numbers, the um, adductor mandibuli in the eel is quite a bit bigger than in the pike. Moving on to um, a new set of a new muscle complex, so the palatal muscles. Um, you've got the adductor arcus palatini, which is the, um, gray, the sort of darker gray here. Um, this is responsible for palatal adduction, so moving, bringing the suspensorium um, medially inwards. And that attack runs from the brain case to the high mandibular. Um, you've then got uh, the antagonist to that, which is the levator arcus palatini, um, which originates from the ventral um, margins of the sphenotic, which is um, a bone um, sort of at the back of the orbit, on sort of skull roof. Um, and then that runs posteriorly and attaches to the high mandibular again. Um, like I said, the suspensorium is a very, very important bone complex, and the high mandibular is especially a very, very important bone. Um, right, and so finishing off with the opercular muscles, um, in purple, you've got the dilator operculi. In the pike, this is split into two, um, a primary division in pink and a secondary division in purple. In the eel, there's just the primary division. And that runs from the anterior brain case and attaches to the high mandibular again. And that's responsible for um, abduction of the operculars, so opening the operculars out um, to let water out of the operculars during breathing and also during feeding. Um, you've also in the pike got this additional muscle, um, the post epistigalis, which um, we're not actually 100% sure what it does, but I think it's um, similar to the dilator operculi because it has a sort of similar-ish attachments onto the opercular. So, um, like lateral side of the operculars, drawing the operculars outwards. Um, then the levator operculi. Uh, I've got those the wrong way around. My apologies. So the adductor operculi, which is the bright green one, um, is responsible for opercular adduction, so bringing the operculars back in. Um, that runs from uh, the posterior brain case and attaches to the medial side of the opercular bones. And then the levator operculi, that ought to be in dark green, um, again runs from the back of the brain case and attaches to the, attaches to the operculars. And that's actually responsible for jaw opening. So what the levator operculi does is that it raises the operculars and sort of rotates them posteriorly. And then there's a ligament that runs from the opercular complex to the lower jaw. And the, rotate, and the posterior rotation of the operculars pulls on this ligament, and that's actually what serves to depress the mandible during, during feeding and breathing. Because there's no actual muscle, there's no jaw-opening muscle in these fish like there is in tetrapods. Right, and so uh, moving on to some of the, um, the actual numbers and quantitative descriptions here, you can see um, from this, this graph, um, the muscles are coded by sort of, you know, which general group they're from. And um, I've also color coded them so that the colors match what they were in the reconstructions. Um, the adductor mandibuli in the eel, you can see, is bigger than in the pike. I should also, yeah, and these are scaled to the same head length. So, um, like I said, in actuality, the eel is a lot smaller than the pike. But in order to correct for that, so that you see um, 
relative size of muscles, I've scaled them to the same, um, so they're the same size. Uh, the palatal muscles are bigger in the pike, and um, the opercular muscles in the pike are mostly bigger, but the levator operculi in the eel is just absolutely huge. And if we go back to the slides, you can see that um, this dark green muscle here compared to this dark green muscle here, which is covering the entire lateral face of the opercular bone almost. Right. Um, quick discussion of these results. So the adductor mandibuli is bigger in the eel. We'd expect that. Um, the eel's actually biting. It's going to need to generate higher jaw closing forces. So um, we'd expect to have bigger jaw closing muscles. Um, the palatal muscles are bigger in the pike, which again we might expect given that the pike is a suction feeder. And so if the, so these muscles are responsible for um, controlling expansion and contraction of the buccal cavity. And so if it can generate a greater lateral expansion, then it's going to be able to increase the volume of the buccal cavity more and generate a greater negative suction pressure during suction feeding. Um, again, we might expect similar things of the operculars in the pike. Um, because again, the operculars sort of serve as the water, the sort of outflow, and so control of whether the operculars are open and closed is going to control whether water can get in or out during suction, and therefore we might expect the muscles controlling that to be bigger in a suction feeder as opposed to a biter. Um, I'm not 100% sure why the levator operculi is so massive in the eel. I'm not 100% sure why it needs such big jaw opening muscles, um, but that's something that I think we'll be looking into later. And so just to round up, um, contrast enhanced CT works. You get really good data off it. You can get data um, that, uh, and this is the first time that anyone's actually produced an accurate 3D virtual reconstruction using methods like this of a non-tetrapod. Um, you can quantify differences in muscle size, and there, these differences are significant between the pike and the eel, and we're pretty sure they're based on feeding ecology. And future directions for this, we're going to take these muscle measurements and these 3D models and run them through some biomechanical analyses. So the rest of my MSC project is going to be doing finite element analysis on these two taxa. And then um, also expanding it, um, increasing the phylogenetic scope of this project. We're hoping to expand it down into the um, uh, sort of vertebrate tree and sort of look at more basal fish because um, a pike and eel, they're good functional analogues, but they're still quite derived within raffin fishes. And so maybe by looking at more primitive raffins that might better approximate what the very earliest tetrapods were doing, um, we're hoping to maybe get a better picture on what's going on with the fossils. Um, my references, um, a few brief, brief thank yous to um, Anthony Orell in Paris and Dominique Adrian in Belgium, um, who are our European collaborators who help with getting specimens, getting scans, um, helping us with the anatomy, and uh, Stefan Lautenschlager for all his help with the Viso, also Tom for his help with the labs, and all the rest of the group here in Bristol. And that's the end of my presentation. Any questions?